Lab-grown meat, why would we actually uh, need this? Because it seems like sort of a scary thought and we all sort of like our meat. Are there any vegetarians, by the way, in the audience? Just a few? I'm, I'm, I'm starting to notice that intellectual people, as you presumably are, um, they're, they're, is the, the frequency of vegetarianism is very, very low. Which I wonder what it is. <laughs> anyway, why would we need lab-grown meat? The, the meat production right now through livestock is not sustainable. Um, we are currently already using 70% uh, of our arable land for meat production through livestock. And the World Health Organization estimates that by 2050, the meat consumption is going to double. So you can do the math, not sustainable. We need to come up with alternatives. Um, the other problem, of course, is greenhouse gases. A, a vegetarian with a Hummer is actually much less damaging for the environment than a meat eater on a bicycle. Um, and that's because animals emit methane. Of course, the ruminologists among you know that, that cows don't fart methane, they actually belch methane, but it's a nicer picture this way. Uh, then there, of course, is the animal welfare issue and the uh, diseases that come with intense herding, so you need antibiotics, and um, they are um, getting into our system, we get resistant to bacteria and so forth. And there are also zoonoses, actually uh, bugs that um, grow into uh, intensely um, herded animals and uh, transmit it to people so that we can get the, uh, diseases from that. Now, of course, there are many alternatives. We can all become vegetarians. You can all become, I can all can become a vegetarian. That would help. Um, but the fact of the matter is that probably is not going to, uh, to happen. So we need to come up with alternatives for the meat production. And um, one of the uh, technologies, or actually two of the technologies that are currently out there will enable us to do that, presumably, um, through stem cell technology and cell and tissue culture. And the reason, I forgot to mention that, the reason why um, we um, think we can do that is because pigs and cows are terribly inefficient in producing meat from vegetable proteins. They were never evolved. The, uh, being food for us was not a selection criterion in their evolution, right? So um, they are inefficient. And if we make this in the lab, we have all the variables under control and we can potentially make it much more uh, efficient. So the, the technology is very simple. We take stem cells. Every muscle in our body, also in our body, has stem cells. And um, they're used to uh, repair injury. And we can grow them. We can take them out. We can grow them. We can multiply them. And of course, that's the trick. Multiply them, make a whole bunch of them, and then grow meat from there. That's the simple sort of um, uh, paradigm. These are these uh, stem cells. They are sitting in between the, the membrane and the basal uh, uh, lamina, and we can get them out. They are easily identifiable. This is actually a technology that exists already for 30 years or so. And if you do the math, if you can double these cells, and if you can go through 50 doublings, which is sort of the regular doubling number of a, a mammalian cell, you can get to a whole lot of kilograms of meat from a single cell. We're currently not there yet. We are at 20 doubling, so that's from one cell to a million cells. But uh, theoretically, we can uh, crank that up. This is how it looks like. Skeletal muscle cells are merged cells. They are multinucleated. There are lots of nuclei. This is an immature piece of uh, muscle, and, but it's already contracting, sort of spontaneously. There's some music in the background. They stay contracting the rhythm, of course. Um, but um, it's live tissue, and you can multiply and grow them. Of course, these cells need to be fed as well. We need to get, give sugar to them, we need to get amino acids and lipids, which, by the way, also sort of creates the opportunity that we can make it healthier, right? We can possibly change the lipid composition, more polyunsaturated fatty acids so that it becomes healthier. But the real question is, can we make it more efficient? And we don't know yet, but we think we can, and mostly because pigs and cows are terribly inefficient. We could also use algae, combine the photosynthetic uh, capacity of algae and use their extract to feed two cells. And in fact, we have already done that, and the cells grow very well on it. So you can actually take out some of the CO2 out of the uh, system. Now, of course, these cells are not working. 
they're sitting there in a petri dish and they're sort of wasted muscle. So we need to uh, train them, we need to condition them. And that's going to cost uh, energy. Um, and so how are we going to do that? And there we make use of actually a very um, interesting feature, which I will um, uh, talk to you in a minute about. And of course, the, the obvious thing is to zap them, basically, with electricity so that they contract even more. That works, and then you see here that from a sort of an immature cell, they become a mature cell. You see all these uh, cross striations, it's typical for a mature cell, so it really works. But we need to put a lot of energy in it. And the question is whether you want to do that. This is if you make a tissue out of it, which you can by tissue engineering techniques. And again, it um, contracts happily when you uh, zap it. So you can train it this way. Fortunately, these cells have another very nice feature that, that they sort of want to be in a stretched condition. So they develop tension by themselves. If you place uh, anchor points in that um, uh, gel, they will actually reorganize that gel in between those anchor points. These are silk wires, but in real life we now use Velcro, bought, uh, uh, bought at uh, Woolworth or something. Um, and these cells attach to it and they create tension and that boosts their protein synthesis. This is what it looks like right now. These uh, pentagonal uh, parts are still the Velcro, it's pink. Um, but the, the, the strip in between is actually the muscle tissue, and it looks kind of unassuming. But it is 80% muscle tissue, and therefore a basis for um, uh, meat. You might say, you know, there's not only meat, or not only muscle cells in that meat, there's also maybe uh, fat, presumably important for the taste. Um, there is perhaps bone, and uh, bone marrow. You don't want to have cartilage, although quite frequently there is, and you wouldn't want to have tendon. And these, uh, all these tissues we can make, that's not a problem. We can dial in the number of fat cells in that tissue. So that's technically not an issue. And actually we are doing that right now. My other profession is making blood vessels and you might think, well, you need blood vessels to, to get that. Well, we don't because we don't have any blood. Um, the pink color eventually is going, come, going to come from the myoglobin. So we do get a natural sort of color and taste to it, uh, hopefully, eventually. Um, but uh, we need a channel system, especially if we want to make that slab of, uh, of meat. Uh, that can be done by just tissue printing. Uh, we now have cartridge print printers where you can print the polymeric uh, sugar chains that are eventually degraded. You can hook it up to a flow system and get the whole thing going. This is sort of an artist impression in how, how it would look like. You would have these incubators um, with uh, hexagonal shaped. You can, of course, think of any shape. Um, printed uh, tissues with a perfusion system through it. This is one unit and an artificial bone. If you make a whole factory out of it with uh, algae co uh, culture, cell culture, um, uh, the, the, the printing, and eventually the packaging, they will come out of that uh, factory. You could also think that you might be able to make this at home. That's sort of interesting. You could, I guess, which would be even more sustainable, but you have to wait for four weeks before your meat is ready because it's based on regular cell division and that's 18 hours for every cell. We don't tinker with that. We don't want to tinker with that. Um, so you would need to know four weeks in advance what you want to eat. Um, of course, we did a life cycle analysis, and as you can imagine, if you, if you uh, make this whole much more efficient, then you would reduce the amount of land and energy and water uh, quite appreciably. Um, and that's eventually the point of it. Now, there are uh, a number of challenges, as I mentioned here. We still need to get more protein in it. We also, also of course, need people to start and eat it. Um, I think we will, because if you imagine, you know, 20 years from now, you have these two products. One is made in the lab with a guaranteed quality. Um, it was good for the environment. It's the same price. It's the same taste. Um, the other one now has ecotex and also has a label on it that animals suffered for it. So what is your choice going to be? I think it's going to be relatively simple if it's uh, presented this way. Of course, it, we have other opportunities. We can make all sorts of meat, all sorts of exotic meats, um, and giraffe, uh, what have you, uh, mixed meats, um, uh, because every creature, um, not every creature, but every mammal and every bird and every fish has these stem cells, so there's basically no limit uh, to it. And of course, then we start to uh, eat meat without it eating our, at our conscience. <coughs> 
Um, and then finally, sort of the ethical question becomes, what is the role of our domestic animals going to be in our society? Because that's, of course, that's a very pressing issue. Um, they are now proud to be our food, and they will, uh, their, their uh, role in life will change. Um, so they may be pets, that's already happening. Now these animals will get um, 300 kilos and they will grow old, right? Because we're no longer going to kill them. Um, fortunately, we are getting older and older as well and fatter and fatter as well, so that will be, I think, a perfect uh, match. Thank you. <laughs> For more big thinking about the future, go to iq2if.com.